Okay, um, I guess we'll kick things off now and as more people come in, yeah, we we'll, we can just start anyway. Um, so hi, I'm Sammy. Um, welcome to this kind of Fear of Living System seminar. And um, we're very lucky today to have Kirsten Gottfried um, talking to us from Germany, from Max Planck Institute you know, for Medical Research in Heidelberg. So Kirsten did her PhD at the University of Cambridge, followed by a Marie Curie Fellowship at Stuttgart before becoming a group leader in Heidelberg recently. Um, and so her group focuses on a lot of really kind of fascinating things, which I guess are maybe best described as kind of biophysically inspired synthetic biology. So a lot of things to do with DNA nanotechnology and origami and mechanics of membranes and all this kind of stuff. Um, and she's just going to talk to us today about actuation and division of synthetic cells with DNA nanotechnology. Um, and I should say just before we start, um, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A or in the chat and I'll monitor this. And then at the end, either um, I can um, unmute you and you can ask it yourself or I can read out the question if you prefer. If you'd prefer to ask your question live, just maybe put a note and just say you're happy to go live or something like that. Um, and yes, I guess with that, I'll hand over to Kirsten. Um, take it away, thanks. Yeah, that's Thanks, first of all, very, very much for the introduction and also for the invitation. I have to say it's a really rare opportunity for me to, to talk to so many people with a theory background. So actually, I'm really looking forward to the discussion and also to your to your questions and maybe ideas that that we didn't come up with, with yet. So so this is uh, really, really nice, I have to say. Um, I should also send out greetings before I start. I should send out greetings to the daughter of Michael, who is watching the Delieferung. Um, so greetings and hi. <laughs> and with this, yeah, we should we should start with the science. So I mean, science in the end is somehow about solving puzzles, right? And the puzzle that has been puzzling me for the for the past years, or the question that I've been really interesting interested in, is the question whether it may be possible to construct a cell from from scratch, so to say. And in bottom-up synthetic biology, this is traditionally actually done by isolating biomolecules from cells, for instance, proteins, um, and then recombining them with the vision to one day create a synthetic cell, create a transition from matter to life in the laboratory. And as you can imagine, this is super hard. And actually, I don't even know if it's possible. And I think this leaves room for creative solutions where actually we start de novo, we really start from first principle and use synthetic building blocks, program their assembly to make synthetic cells with entirely new ways of information storage replication, which may look a bit different from life as we know it, but have the same basic functionality. Because if you think about it, Recombining the pieces of the puzzle may actually be super hard, whereas if you're open to use new tools and new materials, this may actually be the more straightforward solution. So if we really think abstract and focus on functionality, this is what I uh, want to show you in this talk. Um, and there you can, of course, the first question you have to ask yourself is what kinds of tools and what kinds of materials are actually useful for the aim of building a synthetic cell. And I should say, first of all, that I think there is no reason whatsoever to be dogmatic about it. So first of all, we are scanning, constantly scanning the horizon for new tools and materials that are coming up. Um, but in this talk, I would like to show you, first of all, one material, namely DNA nanotechnology, and one tool, namely microfluidics, that we found very useful until now um, for the creation of a synthetic cell from scratch. And then I will also show you how we started to combine the two towards really the de novo assembly of a synthetic cell. Yeah, so let's get started. Um, Let's start with microfluidics and how they are, how it, how this is useful for assembling a synthetic cell. So actually, in microfluidics, there has been lots of on-chip functions that have been developed for completely different purposes, but we can directly take them and repurpose them for the assembly of a synthetic cell. So first of all, there are modules to make cell-sized compartments. Uh, this is done here by intercepting a water flow coming from the right uh, with an oil flow coming from top to bottom. And note that this video is slowed down by about 1,000 times. So this is really high throughput. Once you have a compartment, you can then inject biomolecules or other synthetic components into these compartments and grow the compartments in this, in this process. You can then move on to compartment division. So we have modules to divide compartments at a microfluidic junction here, so mechanically. 
we can then uh, select or sort these compartments according to specific properties as kind of an artificial selection mechanism and finally release them or 3D print them in a physiological environment. So this is why if I see all these modules playing together, I can really somehow envision an automated assembly line for synthetic cells. And I mean, I should really say that these are modules that we are using in the lab. It's not, it's not me or us who have developed them. We've just taken them from, from pre-existing publications and basically used them for, for a new purpose. So um, we're not really developing microfluidics, but just repurposing it in a way. Yeah, then... Um, then I should point out an important, as maybe subtle, but very important difference. So um, a microfluidic compartment in the first instance may be cell-sized, but it's not really cell-like because it's a water in oil emulsion. So we have oil on the outside and water on the inside. And this is very different from what we know from, from living cells, which have a lipid bilayer membrane, water on the inside and water on the outside and can interact with their environment. Um, so a GUV is what we ultimately want. It's a cell-sized lipid bilayer enclosed compartment as a, as a better mimic of a living cell. Because for instance, here we can also uh, reconstitute transmembrane proteins, um, which, are, which are crucial in the end. So this is important to point out. Of course, these lipid, uh, these water and oil compartments are much easier to work with. And in some cases they may be sufficient because they give you compartmentalization of a reaction, which, which can already be enough for some applications. But if we are really serious about moving to more, to more cell-like systems, then we should move to giant unilamellar vesicles, to lipid bilayer and closed compartments. And uh, for this reason, I uh, actually developed a technique to start with a water and oil droplet and transform this water and oil droplet with into a GOV. So how is this done? So in the first instance, I'm encapsulating all of the components that I want to, uh, to have in my synthetic cell inside this water and oil compartment. And I'm also encapsulating lipids. And then under the right conditions, we can have fusion of the lipids at the, uh, at the water oil interface, which is here stabilized by surfactants. And this fusion process kind of creates a supported lipid bilayer structure in 3D. So now we have kind of a spherical supported lipid bilayer um, that has formed. And we can then use chemistry, uh, chemicals to break up the emulsion um, and uh, release the giant unilamellar vesicle, which is now enclosed by a lipid bilayer into an aqueous environment. And this is how we can really transform a microfluidic droplet into a giant unilamellar uh, vesicle. And we'll do that again and again in the course of this talk. And I should also really say that you don't really require knowledge in microfluidics. Actually, um, what you can do is you can create the emulsion simply by, by shaking. And this is why I, I'm also highlighting this, uh, this technique so much because um, even I would say for, for someone who is, who is not familiar with a giant lamella vesicles or, or uh, microfluidics, this is a very nice, very easy strategy to make them. And giant lamella vesicles are, are not always easy to, to make with, with other technologies, especially if you think about encapsulation efficiencies. So this might be a, might be a tool um, that, that um, is maybe hopefully useful for, for some other groups as well. The tricky part, of course, I, I, I should say, is this fusion process. So in theory, it's quite simple, right? If you, if you have uh, basically um, charge repulsion, it's a charge mediated process. So if you have got uh, negatively charged lipids inside the water and oil compartment, then they won't fuse with the compartment periphery. In this case, you have to add uh, magnesium ions to bridge the charge, in which case you then get fusion. If, on the other hand, you use positively charged lipids, then you should omit the magnesium ions because then you get uh, you get uh, charge mediated interactions between the lipids and the negatively charged surfactants and if you add magnesium ions in this case uh, of the positively charged surfactants actually uh, of the positively charged lipids actually you don't get fusion so this entire process of fusion of the lipid bilayer is really regulated by charges and one should say that um, charges in the system are really in the lipids in the surfactants and in the 
in the ions inside this buffer. So these are the three parameters that you can control. And with this, you, you are quite versatile with the systems that you build. For instance, you can also build multi-compartment systems where you mix negatively charged and positively charged lipids. And then you can have um, a lipid bilayer compartment, a big compartment forming, and uh, still many, many small compartments distributed in on the inside. Actually, they are too small to be resolved optically. So these are really small unilamella vesicles distributed all across this compartment. And now if you think about the, about the structure of a eukaryotic cell, you always have like internal compartments inside it. So this, this method really gives us a handle to also create multi-compartment uh, multi, uh, systems. And I should really stress stress how easy it is. So you take a water and oil, uh, you take an a mul you take a, a, a an oil surfactant mix, you add um, you add the components that you want to encapsulate. You then shake it on a on a vortexer basically, um, and this is where you create the emulsions. And then you add a destabilizing agent to to release the GOVs into the into the aqueous environment. And like this, you can really make large quantities of these synthetic cell modules um, in, a, in a very simple strategy. So this is what, uh, what we'll use quite often in the, in the, in the talk. And, and also, again, to highlight the difference between um, a surfactant stabilized compartment, a water and oil compartment, and really a lipid membrane enclosed compartment. So yeah, with this, I've shown you that uh, microfluidics gives us a tool to make cell-sized compartments and also to transform them into lipid bilayer enclosed uh, compartments. So now coming to DNA nanotechnology, why is DNA nanotechnology a useful, um, uh, providing a useful material? So first of all, DNA nanotechnology is really about repurposing DNA as a construction material, simply based on the complementary base pairing of DNA. So this is not about genetics, it's really purely about architecture with DNA. And now you may say, well, a linear duplex may not be of much use for construction. So actually, to make more complex shapes, we rely on a technique called DNA origami, where actually you start to take a single strand of DNA, often from a virus, it's just a long DNA with a known sequence. You add some short pieces of DNA, which match in very specific positions and thereby fold the long strand of DNA up into a desired shape. And now if you use a different set of these short oligos, short DNA sequences, you can reconfigure the shape into a different shape. And this uh, provides a handle for dynamics and this is uh, why it's useful for synthetic biology. One of the first useful structures um, that, that I made was actually uh, DNA-based ion channels. So um, if you think about it, um, ion channels in general are quite difficult often to reconstitute inside lipid membranes, um, especially if they are large. So actually making your own ion channels the, the way you need them for a specific application can be, can be quite useful. And I don't want to go into this work in detail. I just want to highlight this one here, the smallest one, um, because it's kind of an interesting insight as well. So um, I, I, when I made these ion channels, eventually I, I, I thought, OK, can we actually take a single DNA duplex as a control. Because in the first instance, you think of an ion channel or a porine, a transmembrane pore as a hollow structure, right? Which has kind of a channel in the center where ions or other, other some substances can flow in or out um, uh, the lipid bilayer. So, okay, can we take a structure which does not have a pore? So I actually took a, a single DNA duplex um, which is functionalized with hydrophobic moieties, in this case porphyrin, so that you can really overcome the energy barrier for inserting this charge structure into the lipid bilayer. So we did quite a lot of work to ver verify that this is indeed sitting inside uh, the lipid bilayer in this configuration. And what we uh, actually did then um, was to apply, a, uh, to apply a voltage and to measure the current. And now surprisingly, what we saw is we saw these discrete steps in conductance or reverse, uh, reverse resistance, which basically means that uh, these structures are causing an ion flow across the lipid bilayer membrane. So this is really the 
ionic current that is um, that is uh, flowing across a single one of these uh, these duplexes spanning the membrane, and we see these discrete contact conductance steps which really correspond to the insertion of one of those uh, into the lipid bilayer membrane. And now you may ask, what is what is going on, right? There's no there's not really a channel, but um, what we what we concluded from experiments as well as MD simulations, um, which were done in collaboration with Alexei Aksimentiev at that time, was that there has to be a toroidal pore forming at the DNA, uh, DNA lipid interface, which is basically opening up a pathway for ions. So there's basically a pore forming around this uh, DNA duplex here. Um, and this is, I think, very interesting because if you think about if you think about the te textbook image, right, you always see that okay, if there is no central channel, we don't get ion transport. We just have a transmembrane protein, and if there is a central channel, you get actually uh, ion transport across uh, the membrane. But now um, one may wonder actually if if we have to extend this picture, so if we can actually have a transmembrane protein which does not have a channel, but uh, simply because of because of charges at its um, at its uh, surface might cause the formation of these uh, kind of toroidal uh, lipid pores. So this is really a question that you can now take back to the biologists. And actually very recently, um, a few weeks ago, I, I, I uh, found a biologist who, who um, actually is also thinking that he knows a protein that is making exactly this. Um, so yeah, this shows you how actually re-engineering can also lead to new uh, biological question. And for me, this also shows that, that DNA nanotechnology is quite a useful tool to make components for synthetic cells. So now um, coming to a much simpler uh, structure from DNA, but actually also the uh, combination of microfluidics and DNA nanotechnology. Um, we started to make DNA linkers. So why um, DNA linkers is actually, is actually the simplest thing you can build from a single DNA duplex, but it is quite useful because it's universal. So whenever you want to link co two components, say component A and component B, typically one very straightforward way of doing this is actually to use a DNA strand. You can link anything from small mo molecules, proteins, nanoparticles, cells, because of the large toolbox for chemical functionalization, also physicists friendly toolbox for chemical functionalization that is, that is commercially out there. Um, the linker length is tunable from ang angstrom to micrometer. The stiffness is tunable. It is programmable because of the programmable nature of the DNA base pairing. And, and also the linkage is reversible up on more or less any stimulus that you like, temperature, pH, light. Um, so this is uh, most important for us because in the context of synthetic biology, of course, dynamics is always, is always key. So actually being able to reverse the linkage is, is very, very important for us. So why are DNA linkers useful for synthetic biology? So um, first of all, if you think about living cells, then you realize that unfortunately living cells don't always use the most straightforward mechanism when it comes to linking two components. So for instance, if you think about how the actin cytoskeleton is linked to the, um, to the cell membrane, then you realize that, that there are about 200 linker proteins involved. Um, now, if you move to synthetic cells, of course, you could reconstitute um, the 200 proteins or at least a minimal set of those. But um, as you can imagine, it's quite, quite hard work. It's actually not that easy. Um, so what can we do? Well, we can actually encapsulate, uh, for instance, the actin, the cytoskeletal protein inside the compartments, but um, we are missing a link to the compartment periphery. So this means that it's very hard to generate actually forces, right? Um, so a straightforward solution to me was, of course, uh, to use DNA as a linker. So imagine you could tether a DNA strand to the compartment periphery, in this case, just a water and oil droplet. Then you would have an attachment handle for a complementary piece of DNA, which can carry an arbitrary functional group like, for instance, actin in this case. Um, so I went and tried this in the lab. So first of all, you see here that the yellow strand, uh, which carries the cholesterol tag, is actually sitting at the compartment periphery due to hydrophobic interactions. And the green strand is also recruited to the compartment periphery due to complementary base pairing. If the two are not complementary, this is how it looks. So the green strand would just be homogeneously distributed inside the compartment. 
Yeah. So we can recruit things to the compartment periphery. How is this useful? Well, uh, basically, what is X? So X can be anything. We can attach a reactive groups. Uh, we can attach DNA lattices, beads, entire living cells, or now it doesn't come as a surprise, also actin fibers to the uh, periphery of these compartments using a DNA strand. Now, this is quite nice because actually, um, if you think about it in microfluidics, um, actually the community from what from which we've been taking so much right has is facing one challenge and this ch challenge is that actually as soon as you want to start and functionalize surfactants this is can be a very very challenging from a chemical point of view and b it can quickly interfere with droplet stability so here with this uh, dna uh, strategy we have really a strategy to put more or less any functional group to the compartment periphery without interfering with uh, the droplet stability so uh, um, this is this is kind of a nice give back for the community for the microfluidics community from which we uh, took so much in the end. Um, so of course we are mostly interested in the actin, um, which we now managed to attach to the compartment periphery, as you can see here. But um, of course, uh, for us, for synthetic biology, it's key to get dynamics right, and a cytoskeleton by itself is not enough. So how do we actually get dynamics? Well, we need several components. So first of all, here, um, actually not labeled, so not shown in this picture, we have our DNA linkers uh, sitting at the compartment periphery. Then we have actin filaments inside these compartments. Then we need motor proteins in order to get dynamics. And because we are in a synthetic system, we can take HMM, uh, heavy myosin uh, coated beads. So not just normal myosin, because actually we get larger force generation with the beads. Um, and then we can we need chemical energy. And in this case, we use chemical energy in the form of caged ATP so that we can actually uh, trigger the contraction of the cytoskeleton with light. So what happens if we shine UV light on the system, then the ATP gets released um, and uh, the, um, the beads start to roll along the filaments and the filaments are shifting against each other and they contract and we get these very nice aster formations inside these compartments. Um, now you can also see this here is the same system, but this time I'm showing a color coded Z project projection. So basically the color tells you where in the Z position you are. So this is a confocal stack, so to say. Now, if we illuminate half of this confocal frame with UV light, we are releasing the ATP in this frame, and then we get this aster formation, this contraction only in the droplets where ATP gets released. Um, now, without the DNA tags, we don't get the symmetry breaking contraction, which is contract towards uh, the middle. We can quantify the amount of, uh, of symmetry breaking by tracking the filaments in 3D. And you see that we get really the symmetry break only in the presence of the DNA linkers. Um, so so this, is, um, this, is, this is nice, yeah. But um, until now, I have to say that all of the dynamics, all of the functional part is still, is still done by proteins, right? So ultimately, we want a functional dynamic DNA-based system. So how do we actually get to dynamics with DNA structures? So here, first of all, of course, you have to think about a stimuli, right? To what dynamic, uh, to what do you want to have a dynamic response with the DNA nanostructures? And here, actually, you have a broad choice, um, proteins, light, temperature, and pH. And actually, in this case, we chose pH because if you think about it, um, the, uniform, the universal form of energy generation and storage in living systems is always proton gradients. So in some cases, yes, the proton gradients are converted into chemical energy in the form of ATP, but the basis of energy generation and storage is always universally in all living systems a proton gradient. So we thought, can we make our DNA nanostructures actually respond to uh, pH? And um, it is known um, that a DNA um, can, can form um, pH responsive, that there are pH responsive DNA motifs, um, such as this one. So what you see here is actually a DNA triplex. So what this is, is a, it's a DNA duplex with a single strand of DNA actually wrapping around the duplex. And this, is, this interaction is held together by, by Huxton interactions. And, and it is pH responsive. So this means if you have this triplex and you add a base, 
then these Hugston interactions here get destabilized. Um, the the um, single strand is, is detaching from the duplex. And this makes it, uh, this is destabilizing the entire structure so that we can have a second DNA strand binding to this hairpin loop over here. Now we can use this to actually get pH dependent cortex formation inside uh, inside our compartment. So um, what we do here is we have a cholesterol tag DNA again, which is sitting at the compartment periphery. We add this DNA triplex motif at low pH. The triplex motif is, is homogeneously distributed inside the compartment, and at uh, at as you increase the pH. As I said, the Huxton interactions get uh, destabilized this triplex and uh, the DNA strand can actually attach to the compartment periphery to, uh, to form a duplex at the compartment periphery. So we actually tried this. And then as you can see here, this is exactly what we observe in the experiment. So first of all, uh, the triplex is homogeneously distributed and then at higher pH, it starts to attach. Now you can imagine sometimes it's quite useful to also label the cholesterol tag DNA strand that is sitting here at the compartment periphery. So we did this, we put a Psi3 tag on this strand, which is something we should never have done um, because what we realized is actually that it's completely changing the system. So what you see here is that we did not change any DNA sequence. We just added a Psi3 label to this strand which is sitting here the compartment periphery to so just a fluorophore label and what you see here is that at intermediate ph basically we see differences right for instance at ph 6.5 we get much more um, much more attachment if there is no if there is no fluorophore modification so we are kind of switching the switching point simply by the addition of a fluorophore so we thought okay now if we want to build like a dynamic dna cortex we need to understand the system in the first place right so this was a word of caution for us so we actually went and tried many different fluorophore combinations to look into this and we actually realized if we look at intermediate ph say ph 6.5 there are combinations where we have complete attachment of the triple stranded DNA to the compartment periphery. And there are other combinations of fluorophores um, where we have no attachment at all. So what we plot here is um, the apparent dissociation constant for all of these uh, different fluorophore modifications. And all you should note here is that how different they, they behave basically. So this really shows us uh, it's kind of a it's kind of a cautionary tale, right? Because normally in DNA nanotechnology, what we do is we choose our fluorophores according to the requirements of our setups, to the requirements of our experiments, to the channels that we already use for other things, and so on, to the fluorescence channels. So we don't really pay that much attention to the fluorophores normally, and this really shows us, especially if we want to create dynamic DNA nanostructures, that we actually should. Um, so we took this as a reason to actually perform MD simulations, or rather, I should say, Maxim Igaev e uh, from, from Göttingen. He was so kind to, to actually look into this with MD simulations. So he, first of all, uh, simulated uh, the Psi 3 labeled DNA strand, which was sitting at the periphery. And he simulated the Psi 3 free single stranded DNA um, at the compartment periphery. What you see here is that, you, that if you look at the probability distribution of the radius of duration, so of the compactness of the DNA, so to say, then you see that without the fluorophore, you also see it in the video, actually, you are much more likely to get these extended conformations compared to the Psi 3 tag DNA, because uh, Psi 3 is a uh, a hydrophobic molecule which uh, which tends to to interact with the DNA basis much more and is therefore stabilizing the more compact conformation of the of the DNA. Um, so this means that the single strand at the compartment periphery is simply less available for complementary base pairing with uh, the triple stranded DNA um, if there is a Psi3 uh, present. Uh, with other fluorophores, we see the same effect, not as strong as with, with the Psi dyes. So for instance, um, an, um, an Atto or Alexa dye is, is also causing this, but uh, it's causing less of a stabilization um, compared to the Psi3. So we're really stabilizing the unbound uh, single stranded state here. 
Now, um, with experiments, um, we also looked into um, the, the second part, namely not just the attachment, but also the detachment. So again, we used caged protons, which we can release upon UV irradiation. And we looked at the detachment of the triple-stranded DNA from the compartment periphery. So basically, duplex dissociation. And what you see here is that uh, for one fluorophore, the, um, uh, fluorophore combination, we really get this detachment. And we looked at this for at the time scale of the detachment for different combinations of fluorophores. And what we actually concluded is that also the um, single-stranded DNA, uh, single-stranded DNA, triple-stranded DNA complex at the compartment periphery is actually stabilized in the presence of the fluorophore. So what this uh, actually means is that we get an, uh, an effective increase of the energy barrier for dynamic reconfiguration between the two states in the presence of, of especially of side eyes. So if you want to put this in a negative way, you can say that the choice of fluorophores can completely alter or, or also inhibit the dynamics of DNA nanostructures. If you want to put this in a positive way, the knowledge about this effect can actually also help you to completely tune the energy landscapes of dynamic DNA nanostructures. So important part is, is simply to know about it, right? Now that we know about it, we can, we can actually exploit it um, to, um, to make a dynamic, um, to make a dynamic uh, DNA-based cytoskeleton. And, and this is what we did. So we basically took a DNA origami structure, as you can um, see in this picture. We attached it to the periphery. Um, we, we functionalized it with the triplets motif and could then attach it and detach it from the compartment periphery, which is leading to this characteristic deformations that you see here. But right now, we are still changing the pH manually, right? We are increasing the pH, we are decreasing the pH. The proton gradients are not generated in an autonomous way. So how can we actually get autonomous proton gradients? So we have to look into energy generation, obviously. Um, how can we generate proton gradients inside this system um, by itself? So actually, I tried to, um, I tried to isolate um, proton pumps from, from living cells and reconstitute them in, in these systems. I can say it's, it's quite challenging. I did not manage to get proton gradients, which achieve sufficient, uh, which are sufficient to actually drive these dynamics um, of the DNA nanostructures. So um, I thought, OK, can we actually take a shortcut and do basically what nature did um, to create eukaryotic cells, uh, namely, uh, namely in the symbiosis. So um, the uptake of formerly free living eukaryotes uh, in a uh, free living bacteria, uh, which represent the mitochondria in, in today's, uh, today's eukaryotes. So we thought, can we actually engineer E. coli to overexpress the proton pump, in this case, xenorhodopsin, which is an inward proton pump, um, which is a light harvesting um, system. So basically, if you illuminate these engineered E. coli, um, then you get, uh, you get proton gradients. So we top down engineered these uh, E. coli to overexpress these proton pumps and we encapsulated them inside the, the compartments. And as you see here in these pH electrode measurements done by Noah Ritzmann uh, and Daniel Müller, you actually see that um, the proton, that as you uh, turn on the light, the proton gradient is, uh, is, is um, starting, so the pH is starting to increase. As you turn off the light, the protons dissipate, the protons flow back, and you can cycle this back and forth. Now, if we go inside the compartments, we cannot put a pH electrode inside anymore, but we can use a pH sensitive dye, in this case, pyranine, to really monitor this, um, this pH changes. So this is what you see in this blinking, is basically a change in the absorption and emission spectrum of this, um, um, of this fluorophore pyranine. So we can monitor the pH change up on illumination that is caused by the E. coli also inside, the, inside our compartments. So now with this, we can realize a quite complex reaction pathway. So we can turn the light on, which means the proton pump becomes active inside the E. coli. This in turn means the pH is increasing. This means the DNA is binding to the periphery. And now if we attach such a DNA origami plate, as you can see it in this AFM image here, to the um, 
to the um, triple-stranded DNA motif and we polymerize it on the membrane of a GOV, then we get a compartment deformation and stiffening. And you can see this in this video, how the E. coli are really, are really deforming uh, these compartments uh, and actually also stabilizing this. So if you now expose, um, if, you, if you now, for instance, look at the membrane fluctuations of the system, you really see that it's completely stabilized by this, uh, by this DNA-based uh, DNA based cortex here. Um, we can monitor this attachment um, actually um, also uh, over time. So um, what we plot here is the, the amount of fluorescence coming from the DNA origami um, when we turn on the light. And you see that basically attachment happens in the periods where we turn on the light. You also see that there is no real de detachment or only very little detachments in the periods when we turn off the light. And actually we found that this is due to a hysteresis effect. So basically we would have to go to a lower pH compared to the starting pH value in order to get detachment, which is, uh, which is due to the hysteresis which, which this uh, DNA triplex motif uh, shows. So yeah, this, is, uh, this, this shows you that actually we can realize a quite complex reaction pathway um, already. But um, if, you, if you ask the question like, is this a living system? Then the answer is of course, no. Um, the answer is in fact that we are quite far away from, from something that you could perceive as, as living, right? Um, so then of course you should ask yourself um, what, is, what is crucial towards, towards building a living system and at least in the perception of many, many people, um, this, would be, this would be replication, right? So in some form we need a mechanism to divide, to replicate our, compart uh, our compartments as well, not just the compartments, as well as kind of an information storage substrates inside them and to do so multiple times. So this is why actually we put up this division, uh, division process high up on our agenda and we thought that this is something we really need to achieve in order to move forward. So if you, if you, um, if you think about it, uh, division is actually something that um, that from a physicist point of view should be quite easy, right? If you have one compartment, you should just be able to break it up into two. And as I showed you in the beginning, you can, for instance, use a microfluidic chip to do this, right? You could break compartments up into multiple compartments, but in the end, you want an autonomous way to divide compartments. And such an autonomous way, um, you could think about reconstituting the relevant proteins, kind of a minimal set of the division machinery. And I should, I should really highlight that there is a lot of work in synthetic biology going on where people are trying to do this. Um, but as you can imagine, it's quite challenging actually to find a minimal set of proteins which achieve the division of lipid membrane based compartments and actually until now it has not been found it has not been achieved so we thought we went back to the drawing board and thought okay is there a simple physical mechanism to achieve the division of giant unilamellar vesicles of lipid membrane based compartments um, so we thought, okay, what do we need? What are the ingredients that you need for the vision? So first of all, somehow you need to define the plane of the vision, right? You need to tell the vesicle where to divide, right? And secondly, you need an increase in surface to volume ratio because two small compartments have a larger surface compared to their volume if you compare it to the initial big one. Then we thought, well, Actually, um, we have tools to do this. So first of all, um, the, it is known that there are lipid mixtures which phase separate into a liquid ordered and a liquid disordered phase. And at the interface between, at the phase boundary between these two phases, we should, we, we are kind of defining a plane, right? And this could be our plane of division. Secondly, we need an increase in surface to volume ratio. And again, it is well known that lipid membranes are permeable to water. So um, this means if we evaporate water um, in the solution, then we get water efflux across the GOV membrane, which is, uh, which is leading to a volume reduction and thus an increase in the surface to volume ratio. Now, if you assume that, um, the, that, there is a, that there is a line tension at the phase boundary, Boundary, which we know is the case, then you would uh, then you would uh, expect that the that the deformation is minimizing the interface between the two phases, and hopefully that um, that uh, um, 
that the energy gain for for basically neck fission um, is sufficient that the energy gain for for uh, complete reduction complete removal of this line tension here is sufficient to overcome the energy barrier for neck fission so we tried this first of all we made phase separated lipid vesicles as you can see here this this worked um, and secondly um, we exposed them to an osmotic pressure where we basically simply evaporated water uh, e evaporated uh, water in the in the GOV solution and as you can see here indeed we get the vision and these vesicles are really completely divided um, they quickly diffuse apart as you can see here and because this system is quite simple. We can actually model it. Um, we can build a simple geometrical model uh, for this process. Um, so what you see here is, is uh, a geometrical model, which has no fitting parameters, completely uh, parameter free, where we simply input that, uh, first of all, um, the osmotic pressure equilibrates. And secondly, that deformation is minimizing the contract area of these, of these two phases. So what we look at here is purely the geometry of the system, so to say. And the nice thing about this model is that we get uh, predictions that we can test experimentally. So first of all, um, the osmolarity ratio that we need for division is square root of two. This is what pops out of the geometry of the system. Secondly, the time point of division is independent of the vesicle size. Third, asymmetric division, so where we simply butt off a small compartment from a big one should happen faster. and Finally, any process that increases the osmolarity ratio by a square root of two should lead to division. So I'm not going to go into all of them in detail, but we can test it. We tested all of them in experiments. I will just look at the first and last one, basically. Um, so first of all, uh, the osmolarity ratio required for division should be 1.41 or square root of two. Um, so we actually, um, what we can actually do is we can plot um, the osmolarity ratio here on the x-axis against a division parameter. So the division parameter, basically, um, we, we defined this division parameter to, um, to quantify the progression of the division process. So it's basically um, telling us how far we are in this process of uh, constriction formation. So it's one minus the, uh, the initial, um, the, the, the current radius over the initial radius here, basically, and then we see that we should get this kind of uh, this kind of a curve. Now we can prepare buffer solutions with these different osmolarities and immerse our vesicles inside them, and then we see that we get static shapes which completely correspond to the predictions of our model. And now these are representative images. Of course, we repeat the experiment many times, and we see that we actually the experimental data is following this prediction quite well. It's a quite uh, reproducible and and um, and um, yeah reliable system, I should say. Um, now. The, the final prediction was that any process that induces a change in osmolarity should be suitable to trigger division. And this is for me the nicest prediction because it gives us complete freedom. So first of all, we thought, okay, I mean, of course, we already showed that um, that uh, water evaporation kind of um, um, leads to this division. So this is one way of doing it. But we also thought, okay, we can actually feed the lipid vesicles with a sugar solution and add an enzyme, um, in this case, invertase, which splits up the sugar solution and is doubling the osmolarity in each reaction step. So we can measure this with a standard osmometer. So here you say, see that, for instance, at a given uh, concentration of this, um, of this uh, invertase, so of this enzyme, we uh, reach an osmolarity ratio of 1.41 after about, um, after about uh, 30 minutes or so. So um, we can actually look at this process under the confocal microscope and we see how as this reaction is moving forward, we get the division of these vesicles. Instead of using invertase, um, which splits up sugar, we can also use uh, photocleavable compounds. As you can see here, uh, we use caged fluorescein, which is actually tripling the osmolarity in each reaction step. And a nice thing is this gives us a handle to actually initiate division locally. So um, we can choose one division, uh, one vesicle to undergo division in a sea of others and uh, just pick it, illuminate it. This is increasing the, the osmolarity very, very fast. So division in this case happens not within minutes, but within seconds. So um, then, of course, you may say, okay, 
Now, after division, we have one vesicle in the liquid ordered phase and one vesicle in the liquid disordered phase. So this is not really suitable for multiple uh, multiple growth and division cycles, right? Because we need this phase separation in order to get division. So what we can do is we can actually feed um, after division, we can feed um, the, the, the single phased vesicles with small unilamella vesicles, as you can see here in green, of the respectively other lipid type. And now, of course, we want targeted fusion between the two opposing lipids. So in this case, we made use of our favorite tool again, DNA, DNA nanotechnology, where we can actually, um, where we can actually exploit complementary base pairing to really fuse the green, the liquid ordered to the liquid disordered lipids and thereby restore phase separation. And as you can see here in this overview picture, actually it's quite, um, we do have some lipids in the background, of course. So yes, it's a messy picture, but you see that quite often we get, uh, we get, we really get phase separated uh, vesicles back, which in principle should be suitable to undergo a second uh, division cycle. Nevertheless, you may say that um, that uh, um, that the need for phase separation is a constraint. So. We, we completely agree. So we went on to actually divide single phase GOVs as well. So in order to divide G, uh, single phase GOVs, we can again use osmosis to increase the surface to volume ratio. However, what we are missing is um, kind of, an, a, kind of a, a, a way to achieve neck fission, right? Because uh, we, don't have this, uh, we don't have the line tension at the phase boundary anymore. So we need a different way to overcome the energy barrier for neck fission. And in theory, it's well known that if you increase the spontaneous curvature at the neck, um, then you should be able to get neck fission. And we did this spontaneous curvature increase at the neck actually by um, lipid peroxidation. So we added a CE6, which is a known anti-tumor agent and a photosensitizer. So we added that to our deflated lipid vesicles. And then if we illuminate with a uh, four or five nanometer, um, then we get the creation of reactive oxygen species here. Um, and this leads to the formation of a kink so we have an asymmetric area increase of the outer lipid membrane leaflet here due to lipid peroxidation. And this is inducing a spontaneous curvature and this we can exploit to really get the vision of single phase GOVs as you can see here. So what's next? Well, obviously the next step is the integration of information storage. So here uh, you see that we already achieved the division of DNA containing lipid vesicles. And now, of course, if you think about it, um, if you if you think about how you could go further, um, obviously evolution can can only act on the phenotypes. So somehow we would need a link between the information and the compartment properties, the phenotype, the shape, the mechanics of our compartment. And this is basically what we are currently working on. Because at least for me, if you ask me, like um, the evolution of these of these systems would be the most exciting. The most most exciting goal that we that we should go for uh, in the future. This already bl brings me to, to my conclusion. So I've shown you um, how we can use different tools and materials, in this case, DNA nanotechnology and microfluidics to, um, to go towards the creation of, uh, of synthetic cells from scratch. I've shown, you, um, I've shown you where we are at the moment, right? Um, but of course the question is, uh, when are we there? And uh, I don't know, this is a question to ask to the theoreticians, I think. Um, but of course, I told you also what's next. So what we are working on is really this link between, um, between information and the compartment properties. And this in combination with the vision should get us at least another step closer. So with this, um, I, should, I should thank the students, especially Ke Kevin and Yannick, who uh, were working on these projects. Um, and our collaborators and of course also you for your attention and questions especially. <laughs>